Um, so, hello everybody for, for joining in. We already had a, a great session this morning. Um, more than 500 people uh, showed up. So, um, very great to at least find a way to co connect with the community through these means. Um, we missed flying so much that we uh, had to put some virtual flying behind us here. Um, and today we want to talk about some of our thinking um, in regards to where we see uh, a need for the future of uh, airline travel, retail, and FMB moving over the next couple of months and years as we all try to recover from this crisis. So, Vimal, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you very much for that, Kian. Um, so, my name is Vimal. I've been in aviation and travel for the last 20 years or so. Um, I've worked across multiple domains in aviation, in, uh, across operations, marketing, commercial strategy. Uh, I set up new markets and channels for both airlines and travel retailers. Um, I've been involved in various parts of the business, as I said. I've, I've done a lot of things except probably fix and fly the plane. Um, I consider myself a digital migrant. Um, I, what, I, what I like to do is to uh, practice joined up strategic thinking um, using digital customer engagement strategies uh, and, and wrapping that together with my subject matter expertise around travel, retail and aviation. Uh, Trace Consulting is my company. It's a management consultancy that is focused on helping travel and travel focused businesses of all sizes from travel tech startups and scale ups to larger enterprises like airlines and airports uh, with strategy operations and marketing. Very happy to be here. Thanks. Thank you so much, Vimal, and thank you for, for agreeing to host this webinar with me. Um, my name is Kian Gould. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of AOE, and um, I, will, I will shed very few words about AOE because today we really want to talk about um, what we're trying to achieve in this, in this new connected uh, travel world. Um, AOE is a company that uh, has been around for 21 years now. And um, recently, we have started shaping the future of airline uh, digital commerce. And uh, we, we consider ourselves the leading travel retail digitalization experts. We now have about 300 people um, that are building platforms that are currently serving a quarter of a billion passengers per annum and powering about half a billion in ancillary revenues per year as of 2019. Of course, this year is a very different year for all of us. Um, but uh, our biggest goal is, of course, to um, get out of the current situation and into a much better world when it comes to uh, what we can offer to our passengers um, digitally in the future. Um, some of you might have seen uh, products or solution that we have rolled out, for example, the Heathrow Boutique or Singapore Airlines Chris Shop or other platforms. Um, today, because we're talking mainly towards the airline community, we will be referencing um, the Singapore Airlines Chris Shop in many cases because this is one of our uh, most recent and biggest successes um, in this progress. So I think what, what we can summarize, um, and, and this is how we would like to get started in this webinar, is that what used to be the norm today um, will very, very likely not be the norm anymore tomorrow. And uh, Einstein said uh, something very nice that I always keep in mind, which is we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. And a lot of the times when you think about ancillary revenues, travel retail, all that comes up again is margins and, and problems and operational procedures and so on. And, and we would like to take you on a little journey today to try to forget what were the problems of the past and look towards what the expectations of the future are and how this with with a new normal becoming more of a fluid term and the term loyalty being redefined and how passengers and or customers interact with airlines we believe that a very new model um, is is needed to go about that and when when we look a little bit past and we will not dwell on the past too much as i said there there are really three core areas um, that have led to the demise of in-flight retailing. Um, and and the, the first and, and very big one is that we as human beings have changed our customer behavior quite significantly when it comes to shopping through the omnipresence of uh, digital and e-commerce offerings. And uh, while uh, in-flight and travel retail as a whole relied always significantly on the uh, impact of impulse purchasing, 
this has been decimated significantly in, in human behavior. And we are now at only 19% of all purchases in travel retail happening on impulse and actually 81% on a global average happening uh, uh, as a planned purchase. And so the former, and I call it former because right now there's nothing happening uh, uh, in the air in regards to in-flight retailing. Um, the former in-flight retail model could only capture a very small fraction of those 19% because it was not um, um, designed to be omnichannel and, and to adhere to those planned and advanced standards. Of course, on top of that, the very limited uh, selection that is possible to offer on, on airplanes um, meant that most passengers would not find the products they're interested in. And so a general disinterest in this model uh, continued to grow over the years. And lastly, um, with, with the huge problems of silos in general um, in, in this industry, um, it led to a very disconnected customer experience. I can only uh, remember too well being on flights where I was interested in a certain product and all the answers I got was, sorry, this product is not available on this flight. Sorry, you should have ordered this 48 hours in advance. Sorry, this can't be home delivered to you. And, you know, of course, if, if these are the customer experiences that, that we all receive as, as frequent passengers, um, uh, we, we will stop becoming uh, uh, engaged with this channel. And so we, we really set out to fix this problem at the source and not just put bandages on the, um, you know, on, on problems uh, along the way. Thanks for that review, Kian. Um, what I'd like to do is maybe take a quick look at what life might be like for us in aviation and travel retail post-COVID, right? Um, now, you know, typically when we look at such things uh, like Black Swan events like this one, it, it, you know, we have to look at the, the macroeconomic, the psychological, the, the economic effects, and, and, and so on. And if, if, if you look at it macroeconomically, I mean, we always, we've always talked about the post-war economy, post-industrial, post-Brexit. Now we're going to be talking about a post-COVID economy. You can well imagine how bad this is going to be. If you just look at the heat map that I'm showing you on the screen right now, how in just a matter of two months, we've come down, you know, aviation has ground to a halt. Um, the economic impact is going to be debilitating, not, not only because of this, but because, you know, there's going to be trillions of dollars of debt, lower GDP, unemployment, lower trade, distrust in political systems. And, you know, at the end of the day, people will also have lower disposable incomes to spend on discretionary things like travel and shopping. It also means that businesses are likely to cut back on travel expenditure. Now, if we look at the future of travel, probably aircraft fleets and airports might become somewhat like white elephants, uh, you know, operating far below planned capacity. The World Tourism Organization suggests that tourism could decline by up to 80% this year compared to 2019 and put 100 million jobs at risk. Um, and while some countries are trying to create a travel bubble or travel corridor, you know, it remains to be seen whether these things will actually work because bubbles can burst, right? I think China will not forget the initial anti-Chinese sentiment in many countries, and maybe we all will not have access to the Chinese consumer so easily ever again. Now, psychologically, there is a feeling that, in, you know, in the middle of all the economic impact, the psychological impact will be even greater. The, the threat of contagion, the fear of the virus can twist some of our thinking and our behaviors towards each other. So a constant feeling of being under threat heightened anxiety levels, mental issues from all this social isolation that we're under. You know, the way that we've evolved over the thousands of years means that we might become more conservative, we might, you know, we might have more tribalistic, uh, less social attitudes. So this is why we see, for example, xenophobia and racism in some places, fear of outsiders, right? Um, I remember when I came back to Hong Kong recently, um, you know, there was all this talk about how expats or foreigners who are coming in are bringing the virus with them into the second wave or the third wave. So our irrational fears around this will eventually lead to something which I'd like to call a low-touch economy or a no-touch economy, where we are fearful of gathering together, we are fearful of touching things, we are fearful of interacting with people in the same old way. And so what this means for travel retail is, if, if, you, if you look at the uh, uh, data from Mindset, Kian, if you could forward the slide, please. Um, if, if you look at the data from Mindset, low, low touch or no touch actually means that more things will be done through digital channels and through devices that belong to the passengers themselves. 
Uh, this is almost obvious to all of us because we've, you know, all these weeks we've been doing a lot of work on uh, on webinars like this. We've been shopping digitally, uh, social distancing, and so on. Um, and in fact, governments around the world are actually subsidizing businesses to actually go online in a in a bigger way. Uh, so together with this, what we see is a, a, a definite move, a, a definite acceleration towards. Uh, things like digital marketing uh, and 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 so on and so forth, right? E-commerce uh, e as well. So, along with the increasing ease of digitalization, our psychological fears are potentially going to cause us as consumers to change our behavior, even if we start traveling again. What this means for us, therefore, is um, with a no-touch or low-touch economy and change traveler behavior. We, we think there's going to be three major trends that we need to look at. So one is obviously, you know, will be new expectations around retail and F&B. Um, are passengers in an aircraft going to be willing to touch retail magazines or handle products? Will they even try to interact with sales staff? Will they be happy to consume airline food that is given for free? Or would they rather, for example, bring food on board that is they feel is more hygienic or, or they may have procured themselves? So the question is this, can airlines actually step in to add value to these concerns of passengers or will they step back and let the passengers handle these things themselves and lose the game? The second big thing we see is a, a new omni-channel and delivery expectations. You know, it's almost passe now to refer to Amazon, Alibaba, Timor, yet these are the organizations at the forefront of a retail experience that we all talk about globally. They are integrated into almost every channel seamlessly. They have multiple business models marketplaces, they have tiers of customers and services. If in-flight retail satisfaction scores are low today and conversion is in the 1% to 2% range, it's only because the travelers of yesterday have decided already that it's too boring to shop in airlines or to shop with airlines. Forget about expecting anything different when you're traveling with an airline. So tomorrow, post-COVID, what are the passengers going to believe? They're probably going to believe even less than airlines can do anything meaningful when it comes to retail. So to be fair, all the omni-channel expectations are going to be even higher than before. The question to airlines is this, will you rise to the challenge? Last but not least, we think that a personalized experience, uh, expectations around personalized experiences are going to grow as well. Again, if we talk about services like Netflix, Facebook, YouTube, Google, they have spoiled us as consumers in terms of tracking our behavior and understanding what we like, sometimes even better than we know ourselves, right? And this is pre-COVID. What about post-COVID? With the increased amounts of time people are spending digitally um, as a result of all the lockdowns, are travelers going to have even higher expectations of wanting really personalized, curated, relevant, tailored experiences? Maybe it's time for airlines to understand that e-commerce doesn't stand for electronic, it stands for experience commerce and not plain old electronic commerce. Kian, over to you. So what does that mean, these, these new expectations that, that the consumers, the customers of your airlines are going to uh, have and have already had for, for quite a while and, and they were simply not fulfilled in the past? Uh, the, the situations um, that, that will happen on board will, will require a lot of changes on the one hand, but a lot of this change has already been coming. And this, this low-touch environment very much buys into the, the entire experience of driving customer engagement much more digitally than, than ever before. And, and one of the few things that we want to go into today is, of course, what does this seamless customer experience mean? And as mentioned before, we will show some examples of what we have done at, at Chris Shop, uh, just to be an example um, for, the, for the rest of the industry. One of the core things that has never really worked properly was a seamless engagement throughout the journey. Mostly um, pre-order websites, if they even existed, the in-flight catalog, the in-flight offering, etc. they were all disconnected silos. So as a passenger, you never knew what you were going to get. You never knew um, what the pricing would be. And, and you would never have the feeling that it is a seamless experience that you can uh, drop off at some stage and continue at a, at a different stage. So creating that seamlessness by connecting all involved systems is one of the most crucial aspects of it. And without that, customer penetration will remain extremely low. But customers are also looking for much more than just the ability to buy a certain product. They're looking 
for something like a sense of place, for real stories, for a connection to the to their airline, because airlines above all are lifestyle brands, and they can be so much better at being lifestyle brands if they fully embrace um, this this attitude of of being there not only as a as an entity that transports people, but uh, as an entity that enriches people's lives. Um, and, and this is something that you can do through a variety of means um, by, by um, you know, giving purpose to your, your retail offering as well. A third aspect that has largely been overlooked in the past um, is the possibility to go higher up in the premium segment um, in regards to your top tier um, loyalty members and, and to really reward status also with benefits that not everybody gets um, um, from a retail point of view. And many brands have been eager to explore these possibilities. Um, and so, you know, but there was never really um, the technology in place and the process in place in order to enable a top tier loyalty member to purchase a product um, that is usually uh, reserved to the most exclusive boutiques. Um, you know, speaking of brands like LVMH or Hermes and so on. So, so there is a huge opportunity here to also premiumize uh, this experience. And lastly, um, to unbreak this complete disconnect between what you can do um, on the different channels with an airline, whether it's the disconnect between IFE and web or a disconnect between app and web, um, this, the, the, this feeling that you're acting with different systems, acting with different vendors, that you cannot use uh, the same voucher codes, you cannot use miles across all systems equally, you cannot continue your journey across the entire ecosystem, etc. Those are all uh, uh, breakpoints that lead to a lot of abandoned baskets. Um, and, and these are the things uh, that are absolutely crucial to fix. The second aspect that Vimal alluded to is the new expectations of omnichannel and delivery. Um, because customers have gotten used to e-commerce companies going out of their way to satisfy them when it comes to fast delivery, when it comes to good customer service, when it comes to uh, um, uh, delivery globally and, and so on. And, and this is something where the in-flight model has fallen short so tremendously in the past because it has all been around how can I operationally deliver a product at a good margin to a customer. It has not really been about what does this customer really want and when do they want it. And this also means uh, quite a couple of things. Uh, on the one hand, it means being there for your customer where they are and deliver them the right product where they want it and not where it's convenient operationally for you. This is the true meaning of omni omnichannel, to leave it to the customer whether they want a seat delivery, a home delivery, a lounge delivery, a gate delivery, a locker delivery, um, or something else. So, so this is really um, one of the things that has made a lot of people abandon shopping, shopping um, in this channel in the past. Another reason why uptick in, in pre-order has been relatively low in the classic model is that it always required passengers to do something that is very unnatural, which is to go to a pre-order website determined to do a pre-order on that flight um, that you're about to take. But this is not natural behavior. Natural behavior is that you might react to getting triggered um, in the right moment, in the right channel, multiple times potentially, in, in order to then um, get uh, interested in purchasing a product or service that is relevant to you. Um, it is not about, you know, putting a, a, a very limited retail portfolio on, on a website and then hoping that someone will find it, but it's about putting everything you can offer as an, as an airline to the world out there. And that also means working with affiliate programs, with third-party acquisition channels, retargeting, working with OTAs. So, you know, the sales of your products and services which is very much in line with the, the idea behind NDC, um, is, is to no longer require that passenger to be only able to do a purchase on, on the one channel that you have built for them. Other opportunities also open up very strongly, completely outside of the classical realm of booking channels for an airline. One of them obviously is social media. 
and the ability to um, very precisely do uh, retargeting based on geolocation, for example, is something that very few airlines have explored so far. Just to give, for those that are not familiar with the term, what this essentially means is a user that is either a Facebook or an Instagram user or, or another social media user like WeChat um, goes to an airport and walks into a store and walks out again. This is a movement that can be tracked pretty precisely and given um, the ability of Facebook and other uh, social media channels to then target very precisely, you could be serving um, these passengers um, advertising for products from your e-commerce platform as an airline um, that are truly relevant for them because they have shown interest in that specific brand. Um, these, are, these are things that are already being used quite strongly in other areas, um, in malls, for example, but have not really uh, made their way into the airline ecosystem. And on the omnichannel fulfillment point of view, of course, as I, as I just mentioned, it is very much about putting the products and services to the passengers where they find the most convenient. And this could mean that uh, a business traveler prefers to get a product, which is a gift maybe for a meeting delivered to their hotel room, or um, a health conscious traveler, which we will have a lot of in the next few months, would prefer to have it delivered to a locker station and luxury products. And this will be, a, it's definitely a strong requirement from the brands should be hand delivered at the seat and not be picked up uh, from a locker or um, just dumped on the seat in, in cellular wrap. So depending on the product, depending on the customer, depending on the relationship, um, omnichannel fulfillment means a, a vast variety of things as well. And the third aspect that we refer to was personalizing the experience to a level that hasn't happened before. And of course, it is beautiful to value your, your top tier members with beautiful uh, uh, bag tags, with you know, welcome with uh, packages, with cards and so on. But true personalization goes much deeper than that. It goes into um, remembering preferences and creating a customized experience, creating, for example, diverse revenue ba models based on what you've purchased in the past, what brand positioning is most relevant to you and customer segmentation, and then running campaigns and, and different channels through that. Um, one opportunity that is, for example, really huge is the opportunity of uh, doing subscription models. Just imagine you are on a plan, you, you are planning your trip, you are ordering a certain um, uh, liquor that you like, or you are ordering a certain um, um, cosmetics item that you like. And the next time you fly, you get offered to make it a subscription. Do you want the, to order this every time that you're flying? Um, now you're suddenly starting to generate a recurring revenue stream without having to spend uh, large amounts of marketing uh, budget on acquiring customers, uh, which is what many other e-commerce players continually have to do. And what this, of course, requires to some extent is building a single customer view. But it doesn't sound as scary as it is, and, and I know that many of these customer view projects are going on at the moment, BI projects, data lake projects, and so on, and they tend to be big monsters at airlines because there are so many legacy systems to be integrated, but you can start with an e-commerce centric approach and derive a lot of the data that you need from that approach and not having to use a lot of the legacy data as well and, and start somewhere rather than wait um, to have the full solution in place. Because um, the word personalization and recommendation has been overused as a buzzword so much in the past. Most of the time, it was not even personalization that people were talking about. They were actually talking about segmentation um, or, or talking about persona-driven uh, uh, content. Um, real personalization goes much deeper than that. And it, it means tracking customer behavior throughout all the touch points that an airline can offer and servicing the right offers at the right time uh, to that passenger with a continuously machine learning um, uh, platform in the background. So over to you again, Vima. Yeah, thank you very much, Kian. So that, that's, a, that's a very, very important point. What, what does it actually mean? I mean, if, if you talk about tracking, that, that exactly ties into what it means to have a seamless experience. It begins, a seamless experience has to begin first 
by knowing who your customers are, identifying them and being able to track them. Now, it's not as creepy as it sounds because everybody's already doing it, right? Tracking basically allows you to know when a customer leaves one buying journey or one buying platform and joins another at another point in time. It allows for multiple layers of media being used uh, and for the customer to pick up basically where they left off, right? In fact, tracking is super crucial for retargeting and remarketing, which underpins any omni-channel strategy. If you can't track, you cannot have an omni-channel strategy. It's as simple as that. So remember that omni-channel is basically an integration of the user experience across multiple channels or all the channels. So you need to be able to know and track your customers accurately. Part of the channel, of course, is that the travel journey, oh, sorry, part of the problem is that uh, the travel journey is not a smoothly integrated one. It, com it comprises of both online and offline components. And this is a important problem to overcome for airlines because you know, uh, if you can't do that, then you can't accurately track customers between online and offline. Um, so the personal device becomes a very important means of tracking. The point to remember though, that regardless of the touch point, you don't have to offer everything to everyone all the time. The key to retailing is knowing when to offer, what, to whom, at what stage of the journey. So the propensity to spend based on need, desire and relevance is actually different across different stages of the customer journey. And we want to show you just three examples of this through the booking, check-in, and in-flight stages. Yeah, so if, if we look at the booking stage, I think part of the propensity to spend is usually around um, uh, uh, meals, uh, sometimes even retail, depending on the products or the services that are being retailed at the time of booking. Seat upgrades are a clear favorite. Airlines already do it. Luggage is another one. Lounge is something that's not done by many airlines. Booking insurance is another thing that we imagine post-COVID is going to become important as people book um, because a small percent, very small percentage of people who frequently travel are the ones that usually have insurance or if they use credit cards, they might have insurance already. So definitely one of the most likely things with the highest propensity to convert when a booking is being made, you know, th these are the three areas that we see as, as, quite, uh, as holding quite big potential. Yeah, so the, the check-in email or, or, or the check-in notification that comes in usually 20, uh, 48 to 72 hours before the flight is really, really crucial because these emails or these notifications have amongst the highest open rates in the world. I mean, between 90 to 97 percent or in some cases, 99 percent. And this is a marketer's dream, right? I mean, if I told you that your email had a 99 percent open rate, you'd be, you'd be drooling. Right. The, the check-in screen is where, uh, sorry, the check-in email is, is, uh, offers great opportunities for conversion. And that's the point at which people might actually start thinking about buying experiences when they travel, uh, maybe even clicking through to pre-order for retail. Now, the in-flight uh, segment, again, is terribly, terribly underutilized. Whether it's from the IFE screen or from the mobile device, I think in-flight offers great opportunity for conversions. Um, particularly around destination experiences. I just saw a webinar the other day from Sojourn that, that actually said uh, they've done some research to show that pre-COVID up to 52% of people book experiences within four days of travel. But post-COVID, people are actually searching and are willing to book experiences within one day of travel. That means on the day of travel, they're willing to actually purchase experiences. So imagine if you could target them at check-in and if you could target them again in flight, right? Um, and of course, in-flight is also a great place to, to offer people, to nudge them towards retail uh, and, and offer them home delivery or, or pick up on arrival. Yeah, yeah, which leads up to a big question that we've also been asked uh, previously to, that, to the webinar on LinkedIn, which is, why does anyone actually want to buy anything from an airline other than a ticket? And I think I like simple questions, and that's why we actually made this part of our webinar, um, because that that the answer to that question is not as simple as, as some might think. Um, I think one of the biggest reasons why people buy things from an airline and will continue to buy things from an airline and why there's a big value attached to buying uh, to, to a brand and airline relationship is that ultimately airlines are very powerful lifestyle brands. And, and here's a beautiful example of how Singapore Airlines have really taken their responsibility of being a lifestyle brand during this crisis and, and showed that they're not just an airline, that they're actually a service organization that is there for the people of Singapore, that is there for 
um, you know, th their customers. And so, so this this whole idea of an airline not just being, uh, you know, an operator that you use to get from A and B, but actually a brand that you relate to, that you care about, and and that you also like to curate and recommend things to you, is something that is still highly underutilized with, for a majority of airlines. Another aspect, of course, is that, and and I'm sorry that the slides are taking quite a while to load. Um, the the biggest part of travel retailing is still and remains gifting. In fact, it is still around 40% of the entire global travel retail volume um, that is around gifting. However, the in-flight channel, because of the limitations of product availability, SKUs, and volumes on planes, have led to something that made it quite difficult to use for gifting because you know, if you look at the essence of gifting, it is about getting special to someone you care about or you love. And how do you do that if you can only choose from three perfumes or three types of jewelry or, you know, you, you name it. Um, it. It becomes very much about the choice that means as much as the actual gift. How much thought went into giving this gift to somebody and how much thought went into finding this gift for somebody. So selling commodities on, on airplanes is, is not something that pays towards that philosophy of gifting being a big percentage of travel retail. The second aspect, which has been largely underutilized in the entire travel retail industry, that frankly, there are very few organizations in the world other than Amazon and Alibaba that have the potential to do better personalized recommendation and e-commerce than airlines. Um, an airline has the ability to know very well what passengers are doing, where they're going, how often, what their income looks like, um, what products they are showing interest in. Um, and so it becomes much less about do you want to buy from an airline, but it rather becomes can we target you well enough so that you can't help it but buy from an airline. Um, and, and we've seen this a lot with, with other tra travel retail brands that have found that it takes up to five touch points before a customer actually decides to buy a brand. So being able to, to be there for the passenger at all the right times with the right products is something that is, is largely unutilized so far. The third aspect is definitely the aspect of uniqueness. And uh, uniqueness in travel retail has certainly also gotten lost in, in several areas. But to get back to that spirit of you know, that flying is something special, that seeing other countries is something special, and that, that bringing something from your journey has to relate to that to some extent is something that is still a big part of travel retail. Because in the end, you sell more experiences and more exclusivity and more uniqueness than commodities, at, at least in the ideal case. And it, we have to move away from this bargain hunting philosophy of Doing everything is is looked at as a discount. Everything is looked at. This has to be, you know, it has to be a bargain. It has to be cheap. Um, and and of course, it's also very counterintuitive the way that currently um, or in the past it has all been about margin optimization. It is much more important to make a small margin on a billion dollar potential e-commerce business for an airline of a decent size than to make a 50% margin on a tiny $10 million in-flight business. And, and this is the opportunity difference that we're looking at. Um, so, so it has to be much more about the passenger in the future than about just the margin. And lastly, and here I would like to hand over to Christine, who has been an expert at, at crew training and, and in-flight retailing for, uh, for a long time. I'm not going to I don't even know how many years. And um, she will talk a little bit about what that means also in humanizing uh, this behavior again um, that, that we are going to miss quite dearly in times of COVID and social distance. Over to you, Christine. Thank you, um, uh, Kian and Terrapin for inviting us to how I see the role of cabin crew evolving when and if airlines progress into a digital shop shopping offer. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Christine Martin and I'm the Business Development Director for Ethos Farm, a boutique 
consultancy. Up to 2018, I ran my own training company, TRT, who were the creators of the in-flight salesperson of the year event, iSpy. Um, I think over the past 25 years, I've worked with probably more than 50% of the airlines from around the world, helping them create a crew sales culture. And Vimal and I are also responsible for the in-flight retail health check webinars, uh, which go out every Monday. So enough about me, I'm here to talk about the crew. Uh, when dealing with crew, you have to tread very carefully. Um, when you're introducing new ways of working, you have to tread very, very carefully. At the moment, crew will be relieved just to get back to work, that they've actually got a job to return to, but they will be affected by the massive job cuts and potential reduction in the crew complement, and oh, even a reduction in their paychecks. They might also be feeling um, a little anxious about their own personal safety and the safety of their loved ones. Uh, in the short term, the wearing of PPE by customers and crew will stifle all services on board. And this is something which is totally out of our control. And finally, the mindset of the customer will affect the crew behavior. Um, there could be a lot of tension in the cabin crew. And we need to, um, tension in the cabin, sorry. We need to ensure that our cabin crew continue to behave as the airline's brand ambassadors. So let's move forward a few months, and hopefully it is only a few months, and things have settled down and more people are flying. And the need for PPE on board, it becomes minimal. And hopefully we will have a digital offering in place. How will the role of cabin crew fit, support and enhance this digital shopping experience? The crew can turn the digital um, offering into an omni-channel experience. With a traditional in-flight retail service uh, being confined to the bin, it opens up many new and interactive ways of exciting and delighting our customers. Why shouldn't in-flight retail have brand and product activations on board, similar to those that we that are so successful at the airport on the ground at ground level, and on board cruise ships at sea? Why can't we make that happen in the air at 36,000 feet? And it could also be a great way of converting current stock into must-needed cash. These activations, of course, would need to be managed by the cabin crew. And I suggest that they are managed by carefully recruited cabin crew, those with a proven sales track record, as the role of influencer, um, uh, category specialist or brand ambassador won't appeal to everyone. Once recruited, they'll need specific category brand and product training, and this could be um, achieved through a central library giving 24-7 access. The fifth concept was put forward by Ethos Farm at a in-flight retail workshop that we held earlier on in the year. So let's just take it that we've successfully engaged the right cabin crew and the crew have successfully engaged the customer. Then the customer is shown how to place an order via their own device or the uh, screen in their seat back. The choice of point of delivery should be many, just as it is with our uh, e-commerce giants. Digital retailing should free up the crew and increase, not decrease, increase the quality and quantity of customer interactions and leave a positive brand impression. And by brand, I mean not just the products, but the airline as well. So my final comment would be, don't forget to recognize and reward their efforts, which are way above and beyond those of their colleagues. And salespeople love and thrive when they, are, when they feel valued. So for me, the Omni Channel is perfect for in-flight retail. It makes buying from an airline accessible to all passenger customer demographics. That's it from me, Vimal and Kian, back to you. Thanks a lot, Christine. And we're ending the uh, part of our presentation. Um, I, and please, if you haven't put any questions in, please do it now. We will have 10 minutes now to answer them at least. Um, and also afterwards, we will um, actually record the video with all the questions that came in because there were so many that we cannot answer them all in, in either this or the previous webinar this morning. 
But after all you've heard, I think it has become pretty evident why so many brands have withdrawn from the old school trolley business um, in-flight uh, approach and why customers have become disenfranchised. And hopefully we could offer a new perspective of, of things that can be done and that should be done in order to revive this channel with a completely new model. And none of what we've shown today is theory. All of this has already been implemented in real life um, with real airline customers. And this is where we would like to introduce you to a concept that we call the new quaternity of travel retail. And this new quaternity of travel retail really means putting the customer at the center of the entire travel retail ecosystem, um, which means working together with retailers, with brands, with airports, creating much more seamless journeys through digital touch points along the journey, uh, delivering real customer excellence and, and connecting the dots that in the past have all been disconnected, siloed services that have never made for real experience-driven e-commerce.